All right, thanks everyone for coming today. Today we have uh, Matt Haber. He's the chair of Department of Philosophy, and he's also uh, collaborating with us to do the short course on reproducibility this summer from June 11th to June 14th. Um, and he'll be talking to us today about positively misleading errors. Okay, thank you. All right, well, thanks for having me here. Thanks for coming out today. Um, it's an honor to be part of the series. I'm excited that we're doing this. Um, <clears throat> let me just get my clock going. Okay, there we go. So I'm Matt Haber, I'm a philosopher of biology. So I have a PhD, so I'm not the kind of doctor that probably speaks at a lot of these things, but that's okay. Um, what I do, my research before I get into the, the talk, is in part on how to do good science. That might be a way to think about what philosophers of science do. And more specifically, I look at how we make good inferences when faced with lots of data. And the, the area I look at is evolutionary biology. So I'm gonna show you an example of something that uh, is a well-known example from the area of biology I focus on. Um, and it's, it's an example where it looks like everything's gone well, but in fact, everything's gone really badly. Um, and it's a really nasty kind of problem because it has all the looks of good inference, but it's actually bad inference. Um, these are called positively misleading errors, and I suspect they are widespread. So to get things started, uh, I've, I've included this photo here, and it's not just because I like dinosaurs, although I do like dinosaurs, and it's not just because ceratops is uh, one of my favorite species in particular, though they are, uh, because it's, but I include it because it's a really great example from our Museum of Natural History <clears throat> on the sort of biological hypothesis I'm gonna talk about today. So the lines that are behind the ceratops skulls, which may be a little hard to see, um, those lines are lines of descent. They're supposed to connect the different species that those skulls come from uh, in evolutionary relationships. So those are phylogenetic or evolutionary relationships. So it's an evolutionary tree. And reconstructing that, reconstru reconstructing that history of evolution is uh, part of what biologists called systematists do. And that, that's the area of biology I focus on. So how to reconstruct that history um, or how to construct a hypothesis of what that history might be has been a serious of uh, has been a subject of intense debate in the biological literature for decades. Uh, today I'm going to show you the, the form of error called positively misleading errors that, dis that was discovered about 40 years ago, um, but I think it, it almost certainly applies in other fields. Okay, so my goals today, hopefully that's large enough you can all read that. Um, <clears throat> first I want to provide a general account of what positively mis misleading errors are, or PMEs as I'll be putting them on there. These are errors of statistical reasoning or pattern recognition. <clears throat> they're well known in the phylogenetics liter literature, but not in other fields. At least they're not called that in other fields. Not that I'm aware of anyway. The larger goal of this project is to convince people that PMEs are likely widespread and that recognizing them in areas outside of phylogenetics is going to be uh, useful. It's going to provide a powerful, powerful set of tools for researchers. And I think this is becoming all the more relevant as other fields embrace the era of big data. Biologists in this area have been working in big data for 40 years, so it's important to learn from other, other areas, right? Um, in the process, I'm gonna explain how these errors generate what I call epistemic traps, the discovery of which dis can disrupt entrenched commitments. This disruption demands a response uh, which can be productive in a variety of ways. And I'm going to go through a few ways that that can be productive and why that's something that, although it's hard to have entrenched commitments challenged and disrupted, why that's ultimately a fruitful and good thing we should be, we should be uh, looking to do. Okay, so first I'm gonna introduce what positively misleading errors are by way of an exemplar case, something called long branch attraction. I'll explain what that is with a little cartoon example. Then I'm gonna discuss what the response was of that community to the discovery of these errors. Um, in short, they freaked out. Um, but it, a lot of great lessons can be learned and, and generalized from that. And finally, I will end with an example from clinical medicine that I think is a good candidate, positively misleading error, and exemplifies, hopefully, um, how a standard treatment uh, a protocol could also generate a positively misleading error and why that should, be especially, that, why that should especially resonate with uh, the health sciences. Okay, so let's start with long branch attraction. This is an exemplar paradigmatic case of what a positively misleading error is. So what is that? Here's a definition, you can read that for yourself. Um, but a positively misleading error is the exact opposite of statistical consistency. Uh, so statistical consistency is a case where you're guaranteed to converge on the correct answer as more data are added. 
So that's a really good feature to have of a system. So you add more data, you're guaranteed to converge on the correct answer. If you have a failure to converge on the correct answer, that's called statistical inconsistency. Um, positively missing errors are a particularly nasty form of statistical inconsistency because you can, rather than not converging at all, you converge on the wrong answer. So that's really bad because it looks like you're getting stronger and stronger support, but in fact, you're getting stronger support for the wrong answer and away from the correct one. Okay. Um, what really matters here is the pattern of convergence on the wrong answer. That's what makes this a distinctive problem and what generates a potential trap. So let me offer a cartoon example of how this works, recreating something like what the original example was. All right. So suppose you have a population of wild sheep living in a valley between two mountains. These are not wild sheep, I know that, but it's a good picture to use, so we're going to do this, okay? All right, now, suppose again that this population splits, it diverges, as, a bio, as an evolutionary biologist might say, and it splits and forms two new species. Both of these still live in the valley. They sort of resemble the ancestral population. Um, it doesn't really matter too much whether you disagree or not about what species are. We split, we get two distinct populations at that point, okay? Let's also say the old species went extinct. That'll help simplify this example. Um, doesn't really matter that much, but we're going to go with that. Suppose again that each of these two new species subsequently split, split once more. And this happens shortly after the initial split. So we have an original population that splits into two valley dwelling populations, and then those two populations quickly split again with each having one population going up to the top of the mountains that they are on either side of, or that the valley, that, that forms a valley, okay? Um, after this period of quick divergence, things settle down a bit and the species start adapting to the environments that they find themselves in. The two mountain species, under similar ecological pressures, transform in similar ways, where the valley species remain similar to the ancestral populations and each other, okay? So we've got two valley species that kind of look like each other. Um, they're most closely, they, they, they had two populations butt off, one each, that went up to the top of the mountains and, and adapted to those, okay. Now, let's simplify things a little bit. So I'm gonna get rid of all the ancestral populations. So we're only gonna see the popu only see the species that are now living. Okay, so we have four species we're working with here. I'm now gonna connect those lines. Those lines show what the pattern of descent was, what the history of evolution was here. Okay, and then let's clean those up and move the pictures around a little bit. And here's what we got. So, this diagram shows a few things. First, it, it resembles an evolutionary tree. It's showing you how these species are related to one another. Okay, so um, the mountain species are sister species to a valley species. That is, they're, they're most closely related to each other. Okay, um, you can also see that some of these lines are longer than other lines. That can represent how much evolutionary change we saw over that same, over that period of time. So this point here represents a population that split. There was a little bit of evolution, but mostly staying the same for that valley species. Over here, we had a lot of change as that species adapted to living on top of a mountain or next, or on the side of a mountain, okay? So the mountain species changed much more than either of the valley ones did. Okay, suppose again, you are a biologist, an evolutionary biologist, and you want to study these sheep. Well, one of the first things you should do is try to construct a hypothesis about what the evolutionary history is of these sheep. That will allow you to make inferences about what happened here and to reconstruct this history. You can't directly observe history. We weren't around for it. Uh, so you have to employ a method that produces a hypothesis from what you can observe. One method you could use is to compare the morphological characters of these species. What do they look like? hypothesizing that those species that are most similar to each other are also most closely related. Here's a hypothesis the similarity method would, would get you. Unfortunately, it's wrong. What's gonna happen is you're gonna cluster together the two mountain species as being most closely related and cluster together the valley species as most closely related. Okay, so that's gonna give you an incorrect hypothesis and it's gonna mean your explanations are wrong or flawed as a result. What if you add more data? Would that help? 
Suppose we could accumulate finer and finer descriptions of morphological and physiological, maybe even molecular data. Unfortunately, including these in the data set would only establish greater and greater similarities between what you suppose are sister species, giving you ever stronger support for your incorrect hypothesis over the correct one. Now you've got an incorrect hypothesis with even greater empirical support. And the more data you add, the worse it gets. So you are caught in an epistemic trap. This is what's called a positively misleading error. To so add more data, you get positive support for an erroneous hypothesis. Okay, this is a cartoon example, but it's a cartoon example of what was demonstrated by Joe Felsenstein in 1978. So it's a really beautiful, elegant paper. If you want a good example of how to have an elegant proof, this is it right here. It's a great paper. Um, he discovered that there were methods being used to reconstruct evolutionary hypotheses that systematically returned the wrong error or the wrong uh, hypothesis under certain kinds of conditions. Um, this paper is where the phrase positively misleading error comes from, and it describes a statistical inconsistency where convergence is guaranteed on an incorrect hypothesis. It's called long branch attraction because it had those, it, it happens when you have long branches connected to short branches connected to another long branch, short branch pair. So under that particular pattern of evolution, under certain methods of evolutionary um, uh, hypothesis reconstruction or evolutionary history reconstruction, you're guaranteed to reconstruct the history incorrectly. And I'll show you another example, a couple examples of that. Now, biologists working in this area have been dealing with big data for a long time. This is from 1978, and they already had pretty good-sized data sets. Crunching the numbers, when I talk to some of these biologists, they remember going through and actually doing the punch cards because they had to go use the big computers back then. And now we could do it on our phones, but um, in fact, they do it on their phones. Uh, so it's important to look at the unique challenges that they've discovered as they worked through big data over the last 40 years and make sure we don't make the same mistakes. Right? We don't want to waste time rediscovering these same kinds of errors. So I think that's a real value in looking at other areas as they've worked through big data problems to see what's going to happen as big data now is everywhere. So I want to look at some features of long branch attraction and the response that generated from the community of biologists and then uh, that will help us understand positively misleading errors a little more generally. And then I'm going to end by going to uh, an example from clinical medicine. So let's look at some of the features of what positively misleading errors are and what the responses were to those. Okay. <clears throat> In general, the pattern of error here is strong empirical support for an intuitively appealing, entrenched, that is well accepted and established, but ultimately incorrect hypothesis. This generates a very difficult epistemic position. It looks like an application of good reasoning, but it's gone wrong. That makes dislodging a positively misleading error difficult. Um, there's evidence for this in the response to Felsenstein's discovery. Right? So he's basically, what, what he argued was, look, these methods that have a pretty intuitive underlying basis, we're looking for sim the simplest answer, for example, to this problem of reconstructing history. Um, they provide intuitive results that look good, but they turn out to be wrong. It, it's hard to convince people of that. So let's go through this a little bit. Um, OK. So first, I want to distinguish a positively misleading error from other kinds of statistical errors. So positively misleading errors are neither type 1 errors nor false positives. Now, I'm not a statistician, so hopefully I won't screw this up too bad. But a type 1 error basically concerns statistical testing of hypotheses. And along with type 2 errors, describes the role of, how the role of chance may be misattributed in explaining a pattern in the data. For sake of simplicity, we can describe these errors, type 1 and type 2, as a mismatch of patterns between a population you're studying and a sample data set of that population. Right? So if, the, if you sample a data set of some population and it displays a particular pattern, we can ask whether the pattern of our sample data set reflects a pattern in the larger population from which it was drawn and therefore tells us something about that population, or whether the pattern we're seeing is a product of unlucky or unrepresentative sampling, so chance. Okay. And a type 1 error is the incorrect rejection of chance as the source of the pattern. A type 2 error incorrectly attributes chance as the source of the pattern. 
A false positive or negative is slightly different. Uh, that concerns failure rates, that is the uh, incorrect reports of the features of a sample. Okay. Type 1 errors aren't going to be resolved by using the same data set. If you use the same data set, you're going to have the same pattern in there and you're just going to repeat the error over and over. You correct a type 1 error or type 2 error by doing lots of different sampling. And the more sampling you do, the less likely you are to end up with a type 1 or type 2 error. Positively misleading errors, on the other hand, um, don't get solved with more data. If anything, they get worse. And it turns out you can actually diagnose them so long as you start off with a good data set. So that's different than what happens with type 1 and type 2 errors. In phylogenetics, for example, um, you can take a huge data set that's generating a positively misleading error using one method and use other methods to interrogate that data set and discover that an error is being produced. In fact, that's one of the big discoveries from investigating and interrogating big data in, in phylogenetics is that it's important to use multiple modes of interrogation on your data sets. So using a likelihood model, a Bayesian model, parsimony model, other kinds of statistical models to investigate the same data set, if you get different, if you get conflicting results that generate particular patterns, that's indicative of you're getting this kind of positively misleading error. Right. So you'll see long branches in one case, short branches in another of a particular sort. You know, oh, this method's screwing it up. In this case, we should go with this one. But there's no one method that's always going to get it right. So you have to use multiple methods. That's a really important discovery. Okay. Uh, and there's great work in the 1990s running tons of uh, work on this. Um, PMEs are also not a function of sensitivity and specificity. That is, um, correctly identifying positive or negative results or failing to identify positive and negative results. Uh, the character sets in, in, in these cases are good. So you can have a good data set, right? So it's not a matter of sampling, not a matter of bad data. Good data sets can still generate these kinds of errors. Okay. So, it's important to distinguish PMEs from other kinds of statistical errors. This isn't about your, this isn't a bad data set or unlucky sampling. Okay. In this case, it's a matter of overly simplistic assumptions about the model used to evaluate the data, and then strong support for a result that looks intuitive, though is incorrect. So remember that when we come back to the clinical case. All right. Um, because this mirrors, because these methods mirror uh, at least one form of good reasoning, they're particularly difficult to diagnose and dislodge. When you've, got, when you've got a hypothesis that's strongly supported and is intuitive, there's not a lot of incentive to go interrogate it again. And so part of what the phylogeneticist discovered is that it's important to use multiple methodologies to find even those well-supported hypotheses can turn out to be part of these mistakes. Okay. Um, this isn't a problem of confirmation. So if you know much about philosophy of science, you might have heard of Karl Popper who argues we shouldn't just be looking to confirm our hypotheses, we should be looking to falsify them. If we try to confirm only, we're going to get stuck in these traps because you can always find confirming evidence for your hypotheses. Great, sounds good, except Felsenstein's example was using a method that's based on falsifying hypotheses. So it's not a problem of confirmation or corroboration, it's a potential problem for any method that relies on convergence. And all of our methods rely on convergence because we want to have a lot of data strongly supporting what we're doing, regardless of in what ways we think support is offered. So um, positive and misleading errors are hard to diagnose, they're hard to see unless you are looking for them and you have multiple methods to investigate them, and they're particularly pernicious when you have a successful entrenched commitment that you're dealing with. Okay, um, so let me look at some of the ways that these commitments can be disrupted and talk a little bit about what sorts of commitments there might be. Um, because I think there's a lot to learn from this as an episode of science about what, it, what good science looks like and what good practice looks like when we're trying to understand things in a sophisticated way. Um, and although in the field I study, in phylogenetics, Things like long branch attraction and positively misleading errors, these are well-established, well-known errors and well-known problems. And people are on the lookout for those. They really haven't moved outside of that field very much. 
And so that's my interest, is learning about these kinds of errors so we can look for them in other domains and hopefully get out in front of them. Okay. So productive disruptions occur around entrenched commitments. What do I mean? In science and medicine, we, can, we have lots of commitments. We might be committed to methodologies. We might be committed to theories, to concepts. We might even be committed to particular brands of instruments in our labs. Um, when that commitment becomes disrupted, uh, that is a challenge. And it's a challenge, it, it, they be, when they become disrupted, that means that we need to either justify the commitment that we already have, revise that commitment, or replace that commitment. That's not always easy to do. We don't like change, but change happens. So disruption can also be a matter of degree or it could be qualitative. Um, a disruption is productive if in the process of re-examining that commitment, regardless of whether it's refined and kept or replaced, if a useful or fruitful outcome is, uh, is the result, then it's a productive disruption. That's what I, I want to see productive disruptions in science. All right. So what happened when Felsenstein proposed his, uh, or, or announced this, disco this, this discovery? It was not warmly embraced. Uh, heated debates followed, as often happen in science when people are challenged in this way. Uh, it's a really great episode of science. And there's a, there's a lot of reasons why it was so strongly contested. Um, but I want to focus on three kinds of responses and why that might be so informative. Now, it's especially informative for philosophers of science like me who care about how science works and how people shift from one set of commitments to another. Uh, but hopefully it'll be more broadly interesting in addition to that. So I'm going to go through and describe what, what was this disrupted and why this was productive. And just to, I'm not going to go into details of this case, I just want to show you an example of why long branch attraction is such an important thing. So uh, this is from Nature, Gen Nature Review Genetics. Uh, it was an examination of pine trees that discovered that there was a long branch in the way uh, that pine tree evolutionary history had been constructed. And this was using this as an example of investigating how molecular phylogenetics has advanced over the last uh, generation. So, okay. All right. Um, one, one kind of side note. So I'm a philosopher of science, but I have an empirical bent. So I was an undergraduate in biology and philosophy, and I basically refused to ever declare which major I was going to do. Uh, so even as a PhD uh, in graduate school, I was in a philosophy department, but I was also part of the Center for Population Biology at UC Davis. So I, I have refused to ever choose. So I, I like data, and to me, this is a data point. So I look at the episode around long branch attraction and that's a piece of data for me. And there's not a lot of good examples of positively misleading errors outside of phylogenetics. And so I wanna find more so I can develop a theory of positively misleading errors. So that's part of my motivation is looking for more examples. Okay, so the first kind of objection um, to, to, to Felsenstein's discovery were philosophical. Uh, and, and I mean that literally. They, they, in this field, the biologists are, are well-trained and articulate and sophisticated with regard to philosophy of science and what science is. Uh, they routinely, they, they read the literature well, they, they do great philosophy of science on their own, and a lot of the initial objections were philosophical. Um, the, the, the method that Felsenstein identified as generating an error was called parsimony. It was based on a falsification approach to doing science I mentioned before. And it wasn't just understood as a technique or method, but it was understood as embodying what good scientific practice and methods are. And especially what good scientific methods and practices are when we're trying to reconstruct history, a, his a historical singular event. So it was a formative moment for this field before Felsenstein came along was establishing this field as a scientific practice rather than an art form. This was a big part of the debates in the early to mid 20th century. And so when Felsenstein comes along and says, hey, that method you developed actually systematically creates error, that wasn't just a challenge to a method, but to the core commitment of what it meant to do science in that field, okay? So that's a pretty big challenge and it's pretty disruptive. 
Um, it was productive, though, because on the one hand, people who remain committed to that central underlying philosophy had to really um, refine what that commitment meant and either revise what kind of methods they're using that embody that commitment or in some places, in some cases, replace those or abandon that. Um, it also saw the emergence of statistical phylogenetics or statistical approach to investigating these data, um, which is a really powerful tool that's been used in many other fields. So I see this as a productive disruption because prior to this, although their commitment was sophisticated, uh, after this event it really generated a pretty powerful and sophisticated literature and understanding of what it is they're doing that's scientific. Um, and as a philosopher of science, that's something I'm, of course, very excited about. It also saw the adoption of a pluralist ap approach to methodology in science. I think philosophers of science, some have appreciated that really well, others not quite as much. But this is a great example of why we want to investigate things with multiple methods and why we want to make sure we're not committed to too narrow of an approach. We want that diversity of views coming in. This actually aligns with a lot of feminist philosophy of science that argues we need a broad range of perspectives to come in to find errors that we otherwise might not see. So this, I think, is a great historical example of the utility of that. Okay. Um, this was also treated as an empirical problem. That is, people just asked, all right, maybe long branch attraction is a problem, but how bad of a problem is this? Like, how, how common is this in nature? How often does... How often do uh, evolutionary patterns actually look like this? That generated a, that was a productive disruption though because it generated an empirical research program that biologists could pursue. So looking at lots of different systems and asking how often do we see a pattern of evolution like this? Is this something we really need to worry about? Parsimony is a really easy to use technique and it's really fast. Uh, the other techniques tend to be much more ex expensive and time consuming. Um, so this kind of study over there showing those pine trees, that's an example of biologists going and looking to try to see how, how much of a problem is this? How often do we see this kind of thing? Uh, it turns out there, it, it's not uncommon at least. Okay. And there's other kinds of empirical problems that were uh, generated as a result. Okay. Um, this is an example of a new positively misleading error. I'm not going to go into the details. But when, when one is discovered, it's a major discovery in the field. So discovering that some method generates a positively misleading error is really important. So that becomes a research program in, a research program in, program in and of itself. Okay. Um, finally, it... it pushed people to adopt a statistical approach. This was another response to Felsenstein's discovery. This was dis disruptive though, and it's related to the other two issues, because it revealed a split in the community over what kind of commitment there was to using statistics. And it turned out that was a, a split that had been papered over quite a bit with parsimony. Um, as these kinds of problems became clear, the statistically minded folks ended up splitting from people who thought that that approach was misguided or inappropriate for a historical problem. Um, Again, it led to, it helped lead to the emergence of new fields in statistical phylogenetics, um, along with a whole new set of research problems. For example, studying the statistical behavior of competing methods interrogating different kinds of data sets. And there's been a lot of really wonderful work done in this field, understanding how to manipulate or interrogate those data sets in different ways, and what we can learn from those statistical methods. Okay, great. All right, so entrenched commitments can come in all shapes and forms, lots of things we, there, that, that we can be committed to. Uh, those can be disrupted in lots of different ways. And then, I'm not sure I love this mnemonic, but the three R's of scientific progress, we can replace our entrenched commitments with new ones when they're, in, when they're disrupted. We can revise our entrenched commitments to meet new needs or challenges, or we can refine our entrenched commitments to secure or strengthen those. So it's good if our commitments are challenged and they survive that challenge because we have a better understanding of what those are and we're in a better position to defend and understand them. Okay, let me end by giving an example from clinical medicine. So this is from a friend of mine, Mike Lanspa. He's a, uh, he's a pulmonologist on campus. Uh, this, he loves this case and, and we think it might be a positively misleading error, something close to it. Okay, so 
this is septic lactic acidosis. I'll explain it in a second. But research on treatment protocols in clinical cases are likely to present many of the features that produce positively misleading errors. The systems being studied are highly complex with hard to discern feedback loops, conflating and confounding patterns emerging from interacting levels and shared parts, and a history of data from which patterns of treatment are elicited. Convergence will be on a standard treatment protocol of a possible set of responses to administer under particular conditions. Furthermore, the advent of evidence-based medicine is prompting a re-examination of many standard protocols and generating massive amounts of data. So this looks like a situation as we enter this era of evidence-based medicine and big data that we want to be sure we're investigating treatment protocols in a way that will reveal positively misleading errors if they are there. Okay, so let's look a little more carefully at this case. So I don't really have to tell you guys, but I will anyways. Septic lactic acidosis is really nasty. It's when your blood starts becoming acidic, and that's just as bad as it sounds. Um, you see it in critical care units. It can be the result of infection or shock or all kinds of things. Um, a drop in your pH, your blood pH is really, really bad because it can impair protein function or cardiovascular activity, and you don't want any of that happening to you. So when this happens, uh, there's a standard treatment protocol. So for years and years and years, and sadly, I, I don't know if it's still taught, um, I, I don't think it's being taught very much anymore, although it, it still might be taught in some places. But for years and years and years, the entrenched treatment was to administer a bolus of sodium bicarbonate. And it's based on the intuitive notion that sodium bicarbonate, as a base, will raise your blood pH. Right? So it'll neutralize the acid acidification. Patients receiving this intervention show improved survival rates. So if someone goes in this, into uh, you know, septic lactic acidosis shock, I don't know if that's how you say that, uh, you administer a bolus of sodium bicarbonate and they get better. Great. And this, there's lots of data on this. There are a lot of cases of people doing better when you do that. So there's lots of data. It appears to converge on supporting that treatment protocol as the right protocol. Everything's good, except that treatment actually is really not good at all. So what's going on here? So in a really great paper by Foresight and Schmidt, in CHEST, the article in the journal CHEST in 2000, they provide a compelling argument that infusing sodium bicarbonate as a standard treatment protocol is a positively misleading result. So in phylogenetics, methods are positively misleading when they converge on an erroneous hypothesis as more data accumulate. I want to suggest in clinical medicine, treatment protocols or standards of care may be positively misleading when they converge on the wrong treatment at the expense of better ones, as more data accumulate as evidence. So this isn't to say that it's a bad treatment, but it's that it's converging on that as the treatment at the expense of better treatments. So, now, I have to confess, Forsett and Schmidt don't use the phrase positively misleading error. They don't call it that. But that's exactly my point. They're not well recognized as a particular form of statistical error or, or error of inference. And if they had, if they were known, they'd be a useful tool. So not knowing that is robbing researchers of an important tool and resource and making it more difficult to explain what's a pretty complicated argument. Right? If we didn't know what a type 1 error was, it's, it's complicated to have to explain it from scratch each time and, and not know that people are trained to understand what that means. Okay, so why do I think this is a positively misleading error? Let, let me go through the pattern of reasoning as I think it mirrors some of what was going on with long branch attraction, as do the responses they received, although I'm not going to go into those because I'm not as familiar with those. So in their paper, they identify four... Um, they identify four core assumptions that justify the interpretation of evidence as increasingly supporting the entrenched treatment protocol. That is, these four assumptions are underlying interpretation of the data as supporting the administration of sodium bicarbonate. And it does so at the expense of better treatments. So they, just, they, they go through each one of these four assumptions and they demonstrate that each of these are flawed, typically as an oversimplification. That, that's the same thing that was going on with, um, with, with long branch attraction. The underlying assumptions turned out to be oversimplifications 
of a complex system. And it was only after interrogation through other models that relaxed those assumptions that we could see that there were errors occurring. So once corrected, the, the, um, that permitted a reinterpretation of the same data. Again, it's similar to positively misleading error. So reinterpretation of the same data that suggests that the support for the entrenched treatment was not positive, but was in fact positively misleading. So for example, assumption number two here relies on an overly simplified notion of physiology. So it makes sense. It sounds, I mean, it's true that sodium bicarbonate will increase, will raise pH, but that, but, but whether it raises pH correctly in the body is a different question. So, so sodium bicarbonate reliably raises arterial pH, but due to compartmentalization of the body, it might in fact lower intracellular pH. And that turns out to be where a lot of the problems are generated in septic lactic acidosis. So that can actually harm the patient. Sodium bicarbonate can actually lower the pH further, harming the patient more. That sort of argument goes for each one of these points. Okay. Is there a better treatment? Right, it's easy to say that's not working well. What's a better treatment? Um, that what's the better treatment the positively misleading support was obscuring from our view? Well, it turns out the treatment with just saline alone works better than treating with sodium bicarbonate. In fact, what was happening is that sodium bicarbonate is administered in saline. And so the saline was having the positive effect and the sodium bicarbonate was counteracting that. But because of the positive effect of the saline, that was swamping the negative effect of the sodium bicarbonate. But it's so intuitive that sodium bicarbonate would be doing the work that we, they were hoping to do that nobody interrogated that. Well, lots of people interrogated it, but it was hard to see that as, a, as, an, uh, as, as an analysis. Okay, that's a classic pattern of positively misleading error where epistemic traps generated and it's hard to see and hard to interrogate underlying problems. And Foresight and Schmidt go through these, all these really wonderful cases that were effectively ignored. I mean, they were ignored for being counterintuitive. Okay. The focus here, though, isn't on the cause of the error, but the pattern of it. There's lots of ways a positively misleading error can be caused. It's the pattern that I'm most interested in. So like with long branch attraction, dislodging, Sodium bicarbonate as a standard treatment has been difficult. It took a long time to do, took a lot of convincing to do. Um, that's an intuitive entrenched treatment with a long history of what appears to be good support and success, and trying to dislodge that is hard. We're, more, we're people more familiar, m more familiar with what a positively misleading error is. Uh, I contend, this is speculative, but that would have at least provided Foresight and Schmidt and others before them with a really powerful tool for displaying just what was going on. Okay, so to recap, um, I showed you an exemplar example of what a positively misleading error is, showing you what happens in evolutionary biology. Um, I suspect that these are widespread. I haven't really made the argument for that, but they're the kinds of things that occur when you have complex systems and you're, you're interrogating with big data sets where the, num where the data can interact in, in interesting and confounding ways. Finding a positively misleading error is typically really disruptive, but it can be positively or productively disruptive. And I think philosophers of science should seek out more cases like this in order to better understand them and learn from them. I'm, I'm gonna leave you with a quote. You might not be able to read that. It's a little uh, hard to see. And it also might not make any sense because it's in the context of a really complicated positively misleading error in phylogenetics. But this is from James Denning and Noah Rosenberg who discovered a really interesting one. And their basic point here is, look, when we discover these things, on, on its face, it looks like what we're saying is there's all kinds of conflicts, the data don't make sense, and we've got a real serious mess on our hands. But they counsel something else, and they suggest this is actually data in and of itself. And discovering these kinds of errors, these kinds of conflicts, tells us there's something really interesting going on with this system that we're not investigating correctly. And I would counsel that that's a really valuable tool for researchers uh, across fields, is when you can discover when you discover a mess and that mess has something going on underneath it, that's a great topic for further investigation. Okay, thank you very much. And I'll
I'll end by advertising two courses that the Department of Philosophy is hosting this summer. One of those in conjunction with the Eccles Health Sciences Library. We're doing two one-week courses uh, around workshops we're hosting. The second of these is on research reproducibility in the sciences. It's June 11th to 15th. The first four days of that will be a, a class on research reproducibility, uh, with the final day being a conference on the topic. So thank you very much. I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, question. So um, one of the things that really struck me is, is that you were saying that you have to use multiple statistical methods. That's right. And that none will really be the, the, the perfect method yeah. for um, any uh, phylogenic problem. Um, but often we teach that you need to use, like, you need to predetermine what your statistical method is, and that's yeah. really bad if you switch. Um, yeah. So, can you just talk a little bit more about that, the whole problem of um, using kind yeah. of multiple statistical methods and why that might be good or bad? Yeah. So, here, here's if, if the error was always in the right, in the same direction, then we could identify a single statistical tool that would identify that correctly. The problem is long branch attraction is one example of what a positively misleading error could be. Mm -hmm. But you actually can get the flip of that. And this is a little controversial whether these happen also, how often they might happen. Mm -hmm. um, but instead of long branch attraction, you might get cases that actually look like the, con the reconstruction that we think is wrong. Mm -hmm. And long, some methods will identify those as a long branch attraction error. and represent them with the long branches connected by small, when they should do it the other way. That is, in addition to long branch attraction, there could be short branch repulsion. Mm -hmm. And we can't know ahead of time what conditions, what conditions there are of the system we're studying until after we investigate it statistically, or uh, until after we use lots of our different methods. Mm -hmm. So that's a roundabout way of saying, um, at least in phylogenetics, which errors are likely to occur depend on the conditions of the system, but you can't know the conditions of the system unless you interrogate it in lots of different ways. And then that tells you from the pattern of results you get from the different methods, that tells you what conditions are most likely there. Um, you can also learn those conditions through other investigations, other biological investigations as well. Um, so I, I don't know the cases you're, I mean, yeah. that's right, I've heard that too, that you need to make sure you're using the right tools. But to use the right tools, you have to make sure you've identified the conditions correctly. Uh, otherwise, you, you might not be using the right tools. Mm -hmm. um, now, there are lots of models and, and tools in phylogenetics which help you select the right models um, that kind of pre-screen the conditions. Um, and I, I don't know whether something like that needs to be or ought to be developed in, in other areas. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm.